My special guest today began working as a teenager in the famous music stores around Liverpool before managing and eventually owning one of them. He's an all-round musician and singer, has been a music teacher, a successful author with books on the history of Liverpool music scene. It's my pleasure to welcome to the show Mr. Tony Bolin. How are you doing, sir? I'm fine, Joe. How are you? Great to be in touch again, Tony. It's been so long. Definitely, yeah. You know, for as long as I can remember, you were the face of the famous Hesse's Music Centre and Curly Music. Sadly, them shops no longer there anymore. But they were my hangouts as a kid in Liverpool. But you started at 16, working at Plug-In, Hesse's other store, in uh, Picton Road in Wavertree. That's right, yeah. I had offers of three jobs that time. One was for Rushworth, one was for Hesse's, and one was for Plug-In. Right. At the time, I didn't know that Plug-In was part of Hesse's. Found out after six months of working there when the Hesse's band turned up at all the gear, you know. So I thought it was John Ryan who I worked with. You kept diaries from day one, which later led to your fantastic books, which we will get to later. But you started keeping diaries when you started working at the store. Yeah, I just wrote down what happened on a daily basis as a guitar salesman and who I met, you know, because I met quite a few famous people in the shop as well. You know, like Peter Gabriel, obviously the local bands, Liverpool Express. Yeah. Colonel Bad Shops and also the real thing. All them guys used to come in on a regular basis to plug in. I used to make the tea for them at that time. <laughs> so I used to write down everything that happened and what you bought, you know. Are you just 16 when you started there, yeah? Yeah, just 16, yeah. Well, do you know what? I mean, I started going, I remember getting out of school, getting a 20 bus into town. Yeah. M- most days, probably four or five days a week. And going into Hesse's after school and Curly's. It's probably, I'm probably going back 40 years. I've probably known you, told about 40 years. Easy. Yeah, it is a long time. You know, yeah. I was a kid, I remember just going in and just go up and all the beautiful guitars and I'd be there for hours and hours, you know. Tony, you're also a musician and vocalist. So yeah. I want to play a track and then come back. You released Champagne's How About Us, which had a lot of airplay on BBC Radio Merseyside. How come you decided to cover this one? Well, it's a, it's a long story, but it's a song that to do with me and my wife. Okay. And she always wanted me to sing it, so I did, you know. I recorded it with Ashley Moore. It done quite well locally, like it was getting a lot of airplay. And we were hoping to try and get it a bit further on, but didn't happen. Yeah. Well, let's play, and uh, this is for Kathy. <laughs>
Great version, Tony. Uh, who did the, the female backing vocals on That's that? That's what I was going to say to you. Sadly, Kaz Travis oh. passed away with cancer a couple oh. of years ago. Great singer. Great backing vocalist, but a great singer. In it. Let's talk about some familiar names you worked with. Ah, Hesse's and Curly Music. I remember, as a kid, the legendary Jim Gretti at Hesse's. Yeah. I mean, even the Beatles had memories of Jim. You know, oh, yeah. Uh, tell us about Jim Gretti. <laughs> Well, well, Jim Gretti used to tell me stories about the Beatles, and obviously it took a bit of pinch of salt, but it was actually true, you know, I found out years later that he was telling the truth. He actually got the Beatles gigs, because he was an agent in the early days. Yeah. And he'd done the album theatre with Ken Dodd and the Beatles. Wow. And um, he also used to teach them chords when we used to come in. Yeah. Lennon and George Harrison and Carton used to come in and take the piss with him. He was good at taking the piss out. Yeah. Anyway, so, cut a long story short, he... He used to show them all chords, you know, yeah. old country chords and stuff like that. And uh, McCartney just mentioned that a few times when he had interviews. And then um, George Harrison once got interviewed and he asked how uh, Jim Gretti was getting on, you know. He was but even when I moved next door to Curley's, he used to always come up to me and say I was the best manager there, you know. He was like, a, yeah. he was a character. He was a well known character. character. Infamous. I remember being at the shop on Saturday afternoon and this posh lady comes in with a young kid. And you could yeah. tell she was well to do, you know, dripping in jewelry and had a fair coat and all that. And um, she wanted to buy the kid a guitar. And I remember Jim getting the guitars down and the kid trying the guitars. And Jim said to the young kid, uh, Give us the one you sang at your mother's wedding. Yeah, that was Jim. <laughs> he was a terror, you know. You, could, you yeah. couldn't trust him with women and shit. <laughs> but he did sell a lot of guitars, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You found some ledgers in the basement of Hesse's. Well, it was a sub basement. Yeah, the sub basement, yeah. which later became a studio. But before it was a studio, it was like storing all the old guitars and rubbish guitars, you know, right. cheap ones, two pound guitars, in fact. <laughs> and uh, I went down there. There was hardly any lighting down there. There's probably one bulb working, you know, and it's the stunk of damp and all that. Hmm. And I went into the corner, found all these books and that, and they were, they were proper ledgers, you know, the accounts of Hesse's in the 60s. Wow. When I opened them up, I was looking at them with Dave going to work there. We looked in, we seen McCartney, Paul McCartney. We seen John Lennon, Richard Starkey, Pete Best, George Harrison. I said, I can't believe this. Wow. And uh, Dave said, what should we do? Should we keep them? I said, no. I better give them to Bernard Michelson, you know, the director. Yeah. So we took them up upstairs and he went, oh, wow. I've been looking for these for years, you know. They're over in the corner with all the rap and everything, you know. <laughs> and uh, they clean up because they were like a hard cover. Yeah. Inside was all the paperwork. There was loads of other guys in there, like Jerry Marston, and everybody was in there. It was yeah. unbelievable. I should have kept them. If I had a camera then in the seventies, a camera phone, I know. Just took pictures. That's the difference, isn't it? I mean, these days people got phones. Were they all uh, accounts on the drip? Yeah, some of them were, and obviously some of the people had been signed for them. You know, the, the parents and what have you. But yeah. it was like a couple of them owed money. You know, they still owed money according to that. In fact, Bernard and Sarah Madsen mm. went out in the van and they were actually going to try and repossess a guitar off George Harrison because he hadn't paid. But they come to an agreement, so he kept all of the guitar. You know. Wow. Stories have never really been printed until I started writing the Hesse's books. And they are true and they were confirmed by Bernard as well. That's fantastic, isn't it? I mean, that's history right there. I mean, it just shows you how legendary these stores were. Big part of me growing up and getting into music been in them stores, you know. I mean, other great guys like yourself working at these stores was Ronnie Westhead, Colin Ben. Ronnie, a fantastic guitarist from yes. St. Helens. Um, Colin was a roadie for Liverpool Express, and I got some great deals from Colin. You got any memories with Ronnie, Colin? You well, know Ronnie, saying? I ended up working with Ronnie, and um, I actually used to, be, used to be a customer of mine when I was in Hesse's, mm. and he was a pain in the bum for being a customer. He used to borrow everything and bring it back, you know, try everything else. Yeah. When I worked with him in Curly Music next door, he used to uh, demonstrate for Yamaha guitars, Aria, Ibanez. Yeah. And he even got the Ibanez guitar made with an inlay in his name in the guitar of the neck, you know, mm. chop neck. But he was brilliant, Ronnie, brilliant guitars. But we also had Stu Ellis, who was an amazing guitarist. I remember Stu, yeah. That, yeah. Was, a, that was a Curly's, right? 
that's right. Yeah. I remember Stu, yeah. yeah. But in um, Essie, we had Malcolm Aline, who was a guitar tutor, who used to play all the jazz stuff and the rap type stuff. Yeah. And we had Dave Gaunt, who was a really good guitarist as well. And he was he was quite funny, Dave. He was always reciting Monty Pythons and stuff every day. You know? <laughs> but we all used to take off Jim Dressy. It was, it was terrible. We used to do <laughs> take the piss with him all the while, you know. But it, it was it was a great place, and it was all hidden, like little nukes and crannies. I mean, we used to go up above the office, and we could hear them what they were saying, you know, when we were looking for cases, because yeah. we used to put the cases on the top of the office, like <laughs> a little, and we crawl up there and get the cases. On. But um, I've got great memories of all the music shops I worked in. And as I say, I, t- I started writing diaries at age 16, but I kept it going right through. Oh, nearly you... 30 years of working in musical instrument shops. Do you remember so, Phil I... Flarty? Sorry? Do you remember Phil, Phil Flarty? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Phil, I went to school with Phil, and he ended up working in Essie's. That's I remember right, going yeah. in one day, I said, you working here? I said, yeah. <laughs> I know you said that the plug-in, the first shop, you served some famous names. Who would you yeah. say the most famous ones you've ever served at Hesse's well, and Kelly's? When, when I was working in Hesse's, police, police came in, you know, the band, not, not the police, of course. <laughs> Sting and, and the boys, yeah. Yeah, they were a bit, like, boisterous them too, you know, Andy. And, yeah. Uh, I was talking to the drummer like, and he was just like playing all kinds of mad rhythms like he was a great drummer. And uh, he's he yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was playing on uh, a Ludwig kit, you know, and he was fantastic. And he invited me to go and watch them. Yeah. So I, I got a lot of backstage passes working in Hesse's. But the one, the special one was when Paul Rogers phoned up. He said, can you send a lad over with a, you know, a load of flex and, and finger picks? And I went over instead, and I got oh. backstage passes for me and my brother-in-law. And uh, it was great meeting Simon Kirk and all that, because I was a drummer at the time. Okay. He was one of my heroes. You know. So I got to meet them all and went backstage with uh, uh, Bad Company. It was amazing. You know. There's one, I think I read in one of your books, you know, was the, um, correct me if I'm wrong, when Wings did the Royal Court. McCartney well, called him for something. In, when I was in plug-in and I was only 16, uh, Paul McCartney phoned up. And I, right. I just panicked, you know, because he was like the Beatles, you know, I was mad on the Beatles. He was on the phone? He was on the, he actually phoned up because he'd, he'd uh, bent one of his, well, the road had bent one of his um, goose on machine heads on his rick. So I, I passed the phone to John and John ended up getting uh, backstage with wings and that. Oh my God. If I'd only been a bit, bit more confident and, you know, a bit older maybe, I might have got to meet Paul McCartney then. I have met him since, but I've yeah. met him now. You have met him, yeah. Yeah, yeah, at Liffel, okay. uh, and at a party once, you know, and I've spoken to him since, you know. I'm mm-hmm. trying, I was trying to get him to, to give me a few pieces for, for some of the books, you know, especially the 60s book and the new Beatles book that I've written. Mm-hmm. But then, uh, you know, it's still difficult trying to get, get to him, you know, because when he was in Liffel, everybody's round, and he has a few guys around and keeping him back and that. But he, he was great, you know, he'd sign things for it. I got a couple of albums signed by him. Yeah. Wow. And then um, a, a couple of p- pictures later on, you know. Cause I got a friend who works uh, as a lecturer at Lipper. You probably know him, John. John Reynolds. Yeah, I know John. John you know John, yeah. John told yeah. me. John's told me some great stories about McCartney at Lipper. You know, he's just yeah. showing up and going in the studio with the kids and just. That's it, yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah. You know. He's a great guy. Yeah, let's play another track, Tony. Uh, this one's going to be an original. Yeah. Um, this one's called "Whatever I Say to You." You and Ashley Moore. Yeah, Ashley played uh, the lead guitar on it. And- guitar on there. I played the keyboards and the drums and bass. I sang. Okay. He does the back and vocals as well, actually. He was one of my students, by the way. Oh, he was, yeah? Yeah. Okay. But he's, he's a great guy. Well, and this is, uh, whatever I say to you, Poland and more. Stand by 
It's got a great melody, Tony. Yeah, it's a special song. That. Do you know you remind me vocally on that a little bit? Colin Vernicum from Black. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a funny story about that, I'll tell you one day. Yeah, because it's, uh, yeah, you know. He sadly passed away as well. He didn't did, he? didn't he? We used to rehearse in the same place. And we, <laughs> it sounded very similar. Also, Dead or Alive were rehearsing in there as well. Yeah. We all had this, like, deep uh, voice that we were using, you know. That reminds me a little bit, yeah, of Colin, you know, because uh, uh, a mate of mine, you probably know him, we all know each other in Liverpool, uh, Jimmy Sanks, that played bass on a couple of tracks. Yep. Yeah, Jimmy. you know Jimmy, yeah. Um, and that was, that was so sad when Colin passed away, it was a tragedy, yeah. yeah. Okay, you later, getting back to the um, the music stores, you later opened your own store, River City Sounds. That's right, yeah, in Seal Street. Yeah. Opened the road from where the Beatles Museum was and that. Quite, quite a few... Uh, Musicians come in there because you were all recording in Park Street, and obviously my mates uh, ran Park Street at the time. Yeah, and uh, Lou used to be on the reception. Lou loves and saw a drummer for Exports, brilliant drummer. He's with uh, the Mersey Beats now, and uh, he used to send them all down to me. You know, so I used to get all kinds of different bands coming down. It was great. We had we had a lot of. Um, they were asking for things which we didn't have, obviously, because I was it was new to a new small business, mm. even though. Um, I'd been working for bigger shops. I couldn't compete with them really at that time. 
And to be honest with you, uh, a sad thing happened when I had the shock because um, my wife had a heart attack at age 36. All right. So the shock sort of suffered a little bit from that because I couldn't be there. And mm -hmm. so we had a couple of young lads running the shop while I wasn't there. I ended up selling the shop to uh, Micro Music. And Colin Ben actually went to work there because he was I, working for them. I was just going to say, I remember getting a PA there, a PVPA yeah. off Colin, and yeah. the, a mixer yeah. and a, what was them speakers called? The, uh, was it the HP2s or something? The big PV speakers. ISIS. ISIS. The ISIS, that's right, yeah. I remember getting them in, in River City Sounds. Yeah. So you're also a musician from a young age. Talk us through yeah. the various bands you played in over the years. Animated Classics is the one that stands out for me. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great band to the end because uh, we weren't quite original, but we were original to the area because we used to you play a lot of electro pop stuff. Um, we used to wear makeup yeah. and uh, we used to frighten a few people because we used to carry the guitarist out as a dummy. And we used to start off the showroom dummies. I remember the show, yeah. And he'd move and people used to get frightened because he, he was quite tall and skinny. Mm. And he had a dead long neck and we used to paint fluorescent eyes on him and carry him out and then he move you know into the audience yeah. and it all be like this you know <laughs> everyone used to come and see us on, our, on the clubs in the clubs and that you know we used to play d-side leisure center and fill the place oh. every time we played there it was it was a really interesting time but then we started going into doctor who and cybermen i was a cyberman on the drums and it was crazy you know we went a bit a bit wild really was you know the first time i saw that band because i seen it advertised in the echo all the time i'm like these are always in the echo i need to go and see you. I saw you on the Griffin on the Dock Road. Oh yeah. yeah. Bank Hall. And I didn't know it was you. And then yeah. I found out later it was with all the makeup and stuff. Up on it, you wouldn't have known, yeah. Yeah. But uh the, the old Griffin pub, do you remember that? I do, yeah. I used to, I used to play the King Harry and places like that, you know. Oh, that was so, rough. Um, I played the King Harry in Anfield by the ground there. Yeah. Do you ever wonder why we're still here? When you look back at some of the places we've played through the years. I know, yeah. Getting out alive, yeah. <laughs> You know, we've all got them crazy stories from... Uh, Crossles Nest we used to play. Like oh, and Scotty, yeah. 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 What other bands uh, stand out for you? Because uh, I know you've been in so many, but... Well, I played in it. One of the bands that I... I was only young, very young, but it was a learning curve for me. It was a rock band called Angel. We'd done the very first battle of the bands in Liverpool on Gulliver's Club, the night club. Right. we come second. Okay. And Buster won it, you know, Rob Fenner and all that. And they went to Japan and all over the world and everything. But um, it was great. We were playing Smoke on the Water, but I didn't have a, a mat to keep my bass drum still, so the guitarists had to stand in front of my bass drum, and they all had <laughs> getting stuck into it. Yeah. And at the end of the show, he had a massive big bruise on his leg where I was kicking the bass drum, you know, against his leg. But we, we went out quite well everywhere we played. And that. But I was actually in two other bands at the same time. I was mm -hmm. in, like, a cover band, and I was also in a, a soul band as well with Robbie Pollard. Yeah, I remember that one. That's right, yeah. Yeah. He's a great yeah. musician. From, from He's fantastic. He went to do a lot of recording and a lot of tracks for the... When the, when everyone started using the backing tracks, he worked a lot in supplying tracks. That studio, RNA Studios. Yeah. That's right. You were also a teacher. Yeah, well, what happened was, um, in between working in music shops, when uh, Kayla Music first time went bust, mm. we opened again. He asked me to go back, and I went, no. That's when I opened my shop. So after my shop went, because I couldn't... Um, stay there because of my wife being ill. I had to look after her. Okay. So I ended up selling the shop to Micro Music. And after that, I was went to college, went to Liverpool Community College, um, music, doing music and stuff like that. And then I ended up teaching in there because the teachers say, you know more than us, <laughs> you know more <laughs> you know about this and you can play all them instruments. Why don't you take over? We went in the picket studio, mm -hmm. and played on the picket and played on a few clubs and that. The, I got all the young lads into bands and got them all jobs and stuff like that. And then um, I got offered a job in uh, Hard City Records, uh, teaching, teaching music performance. Yeah. You know, how to behave on stage and all about health and safety and all that, and mm. fire exits, and how to go to gigs and assess everybody at gigs and stuff. Then I ended up running the place. And I had a 24 track, track studio, which was owned by Pete Wiley originally. And uh, so we used to record all the bands in there. And after that, it became Creative Industries and went bigger. I ended up running two places at the same time, studio and teaching and running all the college. You know, it was great. You've been around and the I had a connection with Lippert at that time. They wanted me to work in Lippert, but I stayed mm -hmm. where I was. Sorry, I didn't go really. I should have to work there. Yeah. 
Well, te- you know, you can study all you want, can't you? Teach them, especially in this business, you can't beat life experience. No, it was it was a great time. It was a good you time. know actually doing them gigs and uh, roughing it and oh yeah, you know. I've played so- well, breaking down in vans and, and sleeping in the van in yeah. the middle of winter, trying to get in the covers off the amplifiers, you know, to get warm. And there was no better training ground than Liverpool. No. <laughs> it can be uh, daunting sometimes. You know? It can be, you know. We're going to play another track, and then when we come back, I want to talk about your books. Uh, talk us through this song, they're Long Gone. Yeah, it's it's about, like, when I was young. It's about, when I was in the rock band, it's about a girl, you know. And uh, I didn't know she was going with everyone else, like. Sort of thing. <laughs> so I just wrote her about it. It just comes to my head, you know, your history. You know. And I had to go and do the Bon Jovi bit, you know. So. Is this also with Ashley Moore? Is it you and Ashley yeah, on this? Yeah, Ashley Moore, he plays uh, the guitar on it. He's, he just, he's a superb guitarist, musician. He's got his own studio. He played in a lot of good bands in Liverpool as well. You know. Okay, let's hear the track. This is uh, Long Gone, Holland and Moore. That's you on vocals. Yeah, yeah. It's completely, you know, it's like two different singers. You know, you listen to the one we just played, whatever I say to you, you're more like a crooner on that one. And that one, yeah. you're uh, rocking it out there, man. Yeah. Well, the chorus is Ashley. I, t- I talk Ashley to sing, and uh, he does the chorus, you know. So um, I just thought I'd have a go, because I used to do a bit of rock in, in, yeah. in the early days. When I was drumming, I used to sing. I always sang when I was a drummer as well. Right. Um, but then I went to vocal lessons. I believe you did as well. But 
You were talking about that, weren't we? Uh, Rona Campbell on uh, the yeah. top, the top of Matthew Street. That's right. Above yeah. the, uh, I think it's now the Hard Days Night Hotel. I used to go up there. Yeah. Funny yeah. quick story for you there. I'm with the lads, two mates of mine, and we're going out this day. Uh, on the last, shall we say, we're in the Grapes in Matthew Street, which is where I met yeah. my wife, by the way. So we're yeah. in the Grapes in Matthew Street, and uh, they said, "Where are you going?" I said, "I've got to go for these vocal lessons, but I'll be back because the lesson was only like 40 minutes or something." So these are just two normal lads, mates of mine, waiting for me in the pub. I goes in, she said, one of your bad habits, when you go for a high note, you tense the back of your neck. She said, so she gave me this exercise. She said, I want you to look around like you're looking at the audience. And when you're singing on stage, always look at all the audience. Don't ever look in one spot. I said, okay, so she gave me a book. She said, drop the book, keep singing the song. She's playing the piano. Pick the book up, go to your left. Pick the book up, go to your right. So you're moving. Wow. And then he relax. And muscles at the back of my neck, something you you know you wouldn't think about. So it goes back, tells the lads, how did it go? And they're just hysterical, laughing in the pub. <laughs> how much an hour to drop a book and pick it up? <laughs> they don't understand, you know what I mean? But I seemed to put a cassette on my stomach, and when I was breathing, lie on the floor, I was like, what's going on here? You know, oh, yeah. I thought you were yeah. getting something or something, you know. Yeah, but it was crazy. Let's talk but about your books. Um, Plug in the Forgotten Years. Is that your first one in 2006? That's the first one. We've done the launch at the cabin. Right. But we only had one book that night because he never arrived. So, mate of mine, Jared Ryan, one of the Ryan brothers, another drummer. Yeah. He went round and got everybody in the place to sign, put, sign the book. So, I've still got that book. It's got 450 signatures in it. Wow. Of all the Liverpool we bands. 350 people in the cabin that night. We broke the rules and everybody was in there. Everyone you knew in a band in Liverpool or a musician were in there. And we had nine bands reformed from the 70s, all different types of bands, to play that night. And it was unbelievable. It was probably the best night I've ever been to, to be honest wow. with you, the music night. Even better than some of the concerts I've been to. Because they were all brilliant musicians and they were all people I used to look up to yeah. and serve in the 70s. But it was just a great night. Everyone was chatting to each other. The only thing different for me it was a bit of a shock because I hadn't seen these guys for years and I was still expecting them to look the same and they've all lost their hair and yeah. you know, big fat bellies and what you. That was, but they were still brilliant musicians and still brilliant singers nine of them reformed for that night nine, for the yeah. launch and actually three of them carried on playing after that and kept together and some of them hadn't seen each other for years and they got together I yeah. got them all together it was like a band's reunited you know wow. through the book because I interviewed like about well, I've interviewed nearly a thousand people now. Really? It was about 700 not a couple of months ago, but it's got worse because I've got into plug in four now. Yeah. So they're like an A4 book, three, over 300 pages, and it's got all different bands in it. So the first one was, uh, like, we've done it like a regular slinky colour, mm -hmm. like a yellow, day glow yellow. But since then, I've had a Noz Easterbrook from the clubs, a 60s band. He's been designing the covers. So there's plug in one, there's plug in two. Plug in three. Plug in three was released Christmas twenty twenty, right? Yeah. The one I've got, what's the one I've got? It's like the um like the pink the red cover. One. The red one is it? Yeah. That one yeah. That's the one. That's the one, yeah. I can see it there, yeah. 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 There's some great stories in that. Oh I mean, that's the thing, I left them to be honest with you, the first one. Um don't interview people when they're drunk. <laughs> I started interviewing people and he'd say all kinds of things that he didn't want printed, you know. Yeah. I did obviously edit it, but I still put things in where they were, oh, you shouldn't have said that, my wife's going to kill me, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all like the things on the road and the set list. And yeah, there's and loads of great band stories in the, you know, yeah, in the book. Oh, they're amazing. On the road's amazing. Yeah, you've also written a, a comedy book. Yeah, yeah, Merseyside, the capital of comedy, because Liverpool, really, has dished out so many famous comedians and the best comedians in the world, I think, you know, personally. But you know what, I, I was telling you a few weeks, about three weeks ago, I had John Martin on the show. Yeah. And uh, as we're doing today, I just go free flow and we just chat. And yes. um, obviously I have a few points I make, you know, when I'm interviewing the guests, but John just, um, I'm like, you know, John, you, you, the lockdown, obviously everyone's suffering from the lockdown. We're pretty open over here now, but over there it's still in lockdown. And I'm, talking to me and he said oh he's had to get a part-time job he said they're in a factory making little chess pieces he said i'm on nights next week <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah so every right. you know it was yeah yeah and another example and i was like uh we live in san antonio 
And Phil Collins is a big follower of the Alamo. He owns a lot of stuff here. He own, yeah, he owns a lot of the like the the guns and everything. There was a model here um, that he owned, and he did the narration. You go into the history shop, and he did the narration on the on the battle and all the lights at pinpoint the battlefield. And one time, he comes here every year for the on the anniversary. At some, really? Sometimes not on the exact anniversary because people know, but he'll do around that period, you know, in March. So me and my wife got in the. Um, we got in the Alamo, and he was he was doing the uh, speaking in there. There was just a few of us yeah. in there, yeah. And I was telling John the story, and he's like, how did you get in there? I said, well, the ranger let us in. There was a few seats left, and we said, we live here, you know, from the UK. And some people from England died as well. It wasn't just the Hispanic, yeah. the Mexicans, you know. So he said, yeah, you know, this ranger, this lady, actually, she said, yeah, let us in on last minute. So I was telling John, he says, um, did you just rush in, like... Because I had Phil said to your wife, you can't hurry, love. I'm like, oh, God. I'm like, where's this going next? But that was when I had John. Anyway, tell us about your comedy book. Well, I interviewed quite a few comedians, lower echelon, as I say. And then yeah. I echelon, which is obviously like Istanbul and then Jimmy Tarbo phoned me. Every, you know, I've got another story for you. And he phoned me up for a while. Yeah. And um, just, just all the top comedians. And to be honest with a guy who. who um, produced the Beatles on, on a program at one point, and um, he also started a program. The comedians remember the comedians yeah, in the seventies. Yeah. The program Johnny Hampton, and he he he, he gave me a great story. And yeah. I also had Barry Cryer phoning me up and giving yeah. me stuff. And Ted Robbins, um, all all the comedians you can think of, who not just the ones from Liverpool, because they were giving me their take on Liverpool comedians, you know, as yeah. well. And then I done all the theatres where all the comedians from the 1700s, because I've done comedians from the 1700s right through, and it's wow. a big book again, you know. It's another big book, which is that's the cover. Okay. Where you can see it. I know you're all listening here, folks, about me and uh, Tony on like a Zoom call here, so we yeah. I can see all his books <laughs> and stuff here. But uh, yeah. it's it's got all like the old comedian Billy Matchett, and I got in touch with he, he lives in America, his nephew. And he gave me all the photographs of Billy Matchett. He was one from the 1920s and 30s and that. Really? So it was great. It was just a... a I love comedy anyway. Yeah. And I thought, you know, let's put them on the map properly. Well, uh, yeah, put them the forward for me. It's great. Say Ken Dodd. Yep. You know. So he's no longer with us. You succeeded in having a plaque unveiled in Liverpool of the famous yeah. Hessies at the site, and it was unveiled by Sir Ken. Tell us about that, Tom. Well, it was just... He'd do anything for you, you know. Mm. Ken Dodd, so generous. You know, he had all these jokes about him being tight and everything, but he was just, he's just a great guy. But you can't yeah. stop him once he starts talking. He's a bit like myself. <laughs> I talk, I go right, you know, go the other way around. And um, he just said, yeah, I'll do it for you. Him and the mayor of Liverpool mm. both unveiled it, you know. And all the Hesse's family were there and staff and everything and all the musicians used to go there. And it was just a great day. And Bernard, who... Actually, he was the manage, managing director of SE's Brought everyone a cup of coffee, and I mean, it was hundreds of people. It was wow. just crazy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Ken Dodd had turned up for anything. But I used to go to all his uh, charity dues, and there'd always be comedians and musicians on there, and you'd know everybody in the audience, you know. Yeah. It'd be like sportsmen. Yeah. You know, Howard Kendall used to go there before he passed and all that. Mm. And Derek Akura, you know, be all kinds of strange people there, and it was, it was a great day out, you know. And uh, he used to get up and talk, but you couldn't get him up. No, I mean, I mean, when he did the theatres, you know, he had no set time, did he? He was on, no, and that was it. Yeah, pull him off. Yeah. John Martin said he used to do two hours backstage after the show. Yeah, <laughs> but John used to write the gags for him, didn't he? Well. He did, yeah. John wrote for and Tarby. He, he wrote for yeah. Tarbuck as well, yeah. And, and uh, Bob Monkhouse. Bob Monkhouse, yeah. John's done a lot. So another um, book you've done, you tell me, you got a new Beatles book. Yeah, I mean, I know I love the Beatles. Uh, when I was young, that was when they closed the cabin down and they were knocking it down. Me and my mates, we were only 15. We were in a band called The Mess, which was the B-side of My Love by Paul McCartney. Okay. We called ourselves The Mess. We went down and got all bricks and tiles from the cabin. I've still got them in the loft somewhere. I did myself, you know. I, I, I went down one Sunday afternoon with my cousin. I was only little and we climbed over. Yeah. I, got, I think it's still me mum and dad somewhere. Yeah, uh, just I, got, I just got the one. Yeah. yeah. But they rebuilt it up the road, didn't they? Uh, I think they used most of the bricks to rebuild the one now. Yeah, yeah, but they did 
throw smash all over the muffin and all that, you know. Yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, what it is, it's all about Beatle covers, you know. Songs the Beatles covered and people who work with them, you know, like Billy Kinsley and all that on the gigs. Yeah. Um I was asking them what covers they thought the Beatles done well and all that. Because a lot of the bands on the same numbers like they did when we were doing it, you know. Yeah. And um also people who've covered the Beatles songs in a novelty way. Strange Beatles songs and that's in there. Merchandise, mm. even Beatle condoms. <laughs> but there is, you won't believe it. Um, yeah. There's all kinds of strange stuff out there, and there's loads of posters. I, I put a load of posters in there. Interviewed fans and people who went to see them when they were in their early days. You know, we had Pete Best with them and that as well as Ringo. Do you know what and I've then, got? I'm sorry. Do you know what I've got? That I really treasure. Uh, one time I was home. It was 2008. I went home for my 40th. Actually, we had, a, we had a party and stuff at home. And one day I went out in town, and I was in um, the Grapes, and Alan Williams was at the bar. And I've drank yeah. with Alan. I've drank with Alan on many occasions through the years. This particular day, we were there for like four hours just sitting at the bar. And he was drinking his little bottles of red wine, telling all the stories and stuff like he did, you know. But he gave me either a business card with me picture on. And I was telling him I'm living in Texas. And he wrote his name and number at the back. I've still got that. Oh, I've yeah. still got it here. Got yeah. Like I've got as you know. Well, I interviewed him, but he was always a bit drunk. Him, oh, and yeah. him and Bob Waller used to. Well, you must know the story of like when McCartney did the cavern when he came back in '99. Yeah. Um, he sent out for Bob to introduce him, and Bob went and yeah. Well, I don't know that. I didn't know that. Well, do you know, you remember Jerry Divine? Yeah. Jerry just passed away. He's a very good friend of mine. I've known Jerry since I was a kid. He was out with Bob Waller, one of the guys from the cavern, come down looking for Bob. He said Paul wants you to come up, and it was in the afternoon. And Jerry went up with him. Because Bob was on a cane. Yeah. And he said, come back tonight and introduce me, like the old days. Then Bob went out, got too drunk again. When he come for him, he said, I'm in no state to do it. Oh. And apparently McCartney was upset. It's actually in Spencer Lee's book, that. Yeah. I thought, yeah. yeah. Well, Spencer Lee's, um, it was yeah. Spencer Lee who gave me the, the title for the book. Was it? Not. Yeah. Yeah. He was kind it's enough. I, I was home in 2019, um, Christmas, and he was kind enough to play some tracks of mine on the show. Oh, and I went, I went back. I got back here and I left the CD there. And he had, he had me on, yeah, twice. And he played uh, one of my tracks to Charlie Lansborough. Oh, very good. Yeah, on the show. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. He, he often brings people on local. You know, he, he brought me on quite a lot. Mm. You know, talking about books and he, he play music. And I was like doing jukebox jewelry with with a few guys. Yeah, on, yeah. On so yeah. you know, he is he is good for that. You know. and Billy Bolt was the same. Billy's yeah, helped so many. Great. Billy was really up for all my stuff, you know. You know, he's uh, he's helped me too. He's had me on the show a few times and played played some of my stuff as well, you know. Um, and he gave me a great accolade, you know, Billy, a really yeah. good one. Which I just want to tell you about because mm -hmm. you know, the '60s books as well. Because everyone said, "Why don't you write about the '60s?" I was in the '60s, but I wasn't in any bands till '68 when I was only 11. You know. Mm -hmm. He said to me, "Your 1960s book is the best research 1960s book I've ever read." Yeah. Really? When he said that, my house is knocked out because he was in the tuxedos and he was yeah. on with the beat and everything, you know. That's right. He was in all the clubs, he was DJing all the clubs, the cabin and everywhere, you know. To say that, I was, I was really made up and quite proud of that. You know? Well, yeah, that's a great compliment. I mean, he's, yeah, you know, right. Billy Butler, he's a legend in our city, isn't he? Yeah. He you is, know, yeah, yeah. He's done so much. Tony got another book, soon to be a film, uh, In the Mood for Murder. Yeah, based on uh, my great uncle who was in Joe, Joe Loss Orchestra. He was also in a band called the Saturated Seven in Liverpool. Mm. Like, they were just like a swing band. You know, you're into swing music yourself. Yeah. And this is based around about 1947 in the Rialto, which was like a, a ballroom in Liverpool. And um, the resident band called the Down, Down Swing Seven, which is a bit of a take on that. Well, my, my great uncle used to give us all stories about uh, playing in bands around that era. And he also used to tell us about the, the gangsters and all that. So what we've done is the drummer in, in the band is um, he's got a club foot and he couldn't join the army and he couldn't go out front. He's a frustrated swing singer mm. uh, and he sells drugs on the side. But it goes on. I won't tell you too much. I'll okay. tell you all the film you know? yeah. Well, yeah. because we're making a film very soon. We've wrote a book. We've got a script and it's uh, it's going to be made into a movie quite soon. Wow, that's one to look forward to. Years, this, but we've we've got a lot of good 
local actors, Liverpool actors, top actors. Yeah. Um, who we're going to use in the film, you know. Can you name the actors, or you you, you got to wait till it gets well, released? Well, I can't name them yet because okay. uh, we've got a sizzle out, you know, a brochure with all right. storyboard in it and all the stars in it, the budget, everything's in there. But I can't really get too much away about that. But the story's quite good because you know you're getting a lot of the uh, the old swings songs in there, even the Glenn Miller stuff. Because they're still playing all the Glenn Miller stuff and all that type of stuff. That's why I called it in the mood for the murder, you know, okay. in the mood and the murder. But basically, uh, it's got a lot of it's quite dark in places. Mm. There's a lot of murder in there, and, but you know it's quite quite bloody in places. Yeah. But it's it's really good. The, also, George, the, the antagonist, he's he's like ARP guy as well, okay. and he gets gets it all a while about his foot and all that. And becomes quite aggressive. But it, it is interesting. We're trying to get. I tell you, who we are trying to get. Yeah. Who's not from Liverpool? He's from Cheshire, but it, it, it's an unusual person to get in but he there's a young guy in the film and we need him to be it he's a singer and it's harry styles oh in one direction uh i've got a contact for him so we're going to see whether we can get him to do it he's just been in a couple of movies yeah. he's only new to the acting game but he's a singer and we've got a few other people who, who are actually singers you know it was just that we thought of him it'd be good good for one of the guys in, in, in the film you know. but there's a lot of famous actors from Liverpool who are doing really well at the moment, so we're going to see if we can get them. Wow. It's not a low budget, it's a medium budget film. Mm -hmm. um, we're just waiting for the sp sponsors uh, okay. to get back on certain things, and then away we go. You think this year, then? It's definitely going to be filmed this year. It's been going on for about five years, this, and it's been murdered trying to get it sorted. Yeah. And obviously lockdown. Drip was a long time, because we kept rejecting certain things. And I had to research thoroughly because people will rip you apart if you don't get the facts right. Mm -hmm. Dave was writing most of the book, and I was giving him all the research stuff and the stories from my uncle. Right. And there's a couple of things that he, he hadn't got quite right, so we had to. I had to sort that out because, uh, like the ship, even the ship that comes into Liverpool with all the sailors coming in, the opening scene is a fight with sailors and some of the people in the real. So I, mean, I, I think the book you like the book as well, but it is. So, the, but the book is out, right? Yeah, you're just going to yeah, make it. Into book, it. You can get it on Kindle for 99p, and you can also buy a hard copy for 8.95. I think it is. I was just going to book. say to you, what's the best platform for getting your books? Music and Entertainment Books. uk. Music and Entertainment Books. uk. Okay. Yeah. Plug in books as well. If you type in plug in books on Google or anything, it'll come up. But that's the best platform for you, Tony, to get it from your website, right? You can get in touch with me on Facebook and stuff if you want to do it any other way. Okay. But mainly PayPal, way of doing it. You know? Right. Tony, it's been an honour. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, share some amazing stories. It's fantastic to talk to you, be in touch again. God bless, mate, and love to the family. Thank Appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. Thank see you. Later. Thank you.